everyone, it's Bryony. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to be talking about my top things that I think you need to consider if you're considering becoming a solo parent by choice. I personally think there are four key areas to think about when you're deciding whether or not this is the right journey for you and whether it's something that you'll be able to manage. And in this video, I'm going to go through each one of them, talking about why they're important and different ways that you might be able to make them work and different things that you can think about so that hopefully this journey is something you are able to do if it is something you're currently considering. I also need to apologize because it is raining really hard outside at the moment and I've tried to wait for it to die down before filming but I haven't got much longer that I can leave it and so if you hear like pitter pattering in the background it's just the weather. So the four key areas that I feel are the most important to think about before embarking on this journey are building your village, housing, finances and childcare. To be honest, they are all kind of interlinked here and I am going to talk about them separately, but I wanted to share with you before I got into the video what the four are because they're going to kind of cross over all the way through this video because it's impossible to fully separate them out because they are all intertwined and that's one of the reasons I think they are the four most important things. But let's start by separating them out and start with probably the most important one when it comes to solo motherhood, which is build your village. Even though we are talking about solo parenthood, the truth is nobody can really parent fully alone. And if you are in a situation where you absolutely have to do that, it's often something that is not through choice and it's also often quite a miserable and lonely thing to do. So it's not something you want to aim for. You definitely want to try and build a village and build a support network around you before you embark on this journey, because trust me, it is gonna make your life so much easier. And the first thing we need to think about when it comes to building a village is whether you have a village that you can build for free or whether it's something you're going to need to pay for and I'll explain a bit what I mean about that. So in my case when I knew I wanted to become a solo parent I knew that I would not be able to do it on my own. I'd been a foster carer beforehand, I knew how important support networks were and so I knew that I had to have my parents support in order for me to do this because I was going to need them to help me in those scenarios where I was you know really sick and I needed some help and also for childcare I thought I might need a little bit of help with that too. And so I had a very frank and this conversation first with my mum and then with my dad about they are so, still together but my mum is kind of the one who I knew would probably do most of the physical hands-on support and to be fair like now that Orient's here my dad does a lot too um, but it was my mum that I kind of initially started the conversation with and she was very supportive of me and she said that she went away and thought about it and felt that they could offer me one day of childcare a week and also an additional afternoon and overnight um, support too. Now I haven't so far needed the afternoon and overnight stay but it is very helpful for me to know that in the future it's something that I could ask them to do if I felt that like I needed a break or I needed some you know extra sleep overnight. Oren, his sleep is not great at the moment but he's never been a terrible sleeper, he's never been one that's been, aside from the eight month regression, he's never been like up every hour or so and I know some people who have really challenging babies with when it comes to sleep and so because he's not been too bad I haven't needed that but it's very helpful to know that it's something that I could have used if I felt like I was really suffering. They are also quite close to me they're only a 10 minute drive away so it's very helpful having a support network that is local so things like that that is a free support network that I have access to and I'm very privileged to do so because I have parents who are very supportive of me, who I get along with, who are people that I trust with my son, which is another important thing to consider. You might have help there physically, people who are willing to help, but whether or not you actually want them around your children, depending on what your own childhood circumstances were, that's another thing to consider. So for me, that was a free village that I had. And for your case, it could be that you have parents that are also really supportive or you might have a sibling or a close friend who's really supportive, but you need to have really open and honest conversations with them before going down the route of trying to get pregnant or adopting whatever it is how you're considering becoming a solo parent, because it's one thing to say that you're gonna offer support and it's another thing to actually offer it. So it's really important that you establish what kind of support are they willing to offer you? Can they quantify it? Is there something where they could say, okay, we'll be willing to help you out every Saturday, we'll have them for three hours in the afternoon? Or is it more a case of them saying, yes, I support this decision, in terms of being like moral support but actually physically they don't feel they can really offer anything particularly if you've got friends who haven't had children it's quite daunting for people who haven't had kids before to like fully take responsibility for a child and look after them on their own so they may not be comfortable with that but equally if you've got family like for example a sibling who's already had kids they're probably going to be really busy with their own kids and so are they actually going to have time to help you out it's why you need to have these really open honest conversations beforehand because the last thing you want is to say 
you know, have a conversation with someone and agree they're going to support you. And then you're like, great, you go ahead, you get pregnant, you have a baby. And then when you start needing some support, actually, they're like, sorry, I can't, we're busy today, or we can't do this. Or, you know, that support falls apart, because then you're kind of left on your own. And that's a situation you really don't want to be in. So really having open, honest discussions with people who you think might be your support networks is a really important first step, I think, when it comes to considering becoming a solo parent. If, however, you do not have any family or friends that you would really trust to step up and be there or who could actually offer physical support, then you're going to need to look at paying for your village. And this could look like several different things depending on your circumstances. So let's say, for example, you haven't got anybody who can be your birth partner or who can support you directly after the birth. You might be in a situation where, like I was describing before with the village, you haven't got parents or a friend or a sibling who could be, you know, support for you on a long-term basis, but you do have a family member or friend who's happy to kind of move in with you for, say, two weeks after you give birth to offer you physical support. In that case, you wouldn't perhaps need to pay for any support then, but if you really have nobody, then something you might want to consider looking into is getting a postpartum doula. This is somebody who can support you right after the birth they can help you with housework with cooking with cleaning looking after the baby if you've never had a baby before they can offer support and advice on that with breastfeeding too typically if that's something you want to do as well so a postpartum doula is something you can really consider looking into but they are not cheap so if you don't have your support network that for free and you're going to need to pay for it this might be something you need to actually save up for in advance but knowing that you're going to need it is very helpful rather than getting into the position where you're pregnant about to give birth and then you realize I haven't got any support and I'm gonna to need to find someone. And then you're like, how am I gonna pay for it? So knowing in advance is very important. If you're not considering breastfeeding, then you might also consider getting something like a night nanny who can allow you to get some sleep at night so that you're better rested for the day. Not quite so good if you're breastfeeding because when you've got a newborn, they tend to wake up multiple times in the night to feed. And so you're gonna to have to wake up anyway. Although some of my solo mum friends did have night nannies and they really liked the fact that they still had some company in the night. They found that quite a lonely time. And so just having someone there to support them was worth it to them but if you are not planning to breastfeed and you're planning to bottle feed then it's definitely something you could look into because you can you know you don't need to wake up to feed them you can have someone else there to do that and that means you can get some better rest so definitely something you could consider if you're in that position another thing that paying for your village can look like is recognizing that you are going to need some childcare from quite early on so even if you are on maternity leave for example in the uk you get up to nine months paid maternity leave you might consider the fact that by the time baby is three months old, you're gonna have had, if you've got no support network around you in terms of family and friends, you are going to probably need a bit of a break. So setting up before you even had the baby or quite soon afterwards, looking into whether or not you can get them looked after by a childminder, for example, for one day a week. And it doesn't have to be a full day, it could be a few hours. Childminders and babysitters tend to be the most flexible with that. You could consider looking for a nursery placement, but a lot of nurseries do like a minimum of two days, so that'll be much more expensive. But a childminder or a babysitter for a few hours, initially from say three months, and then you can maybe build up to one or two days a week, for example, and it could just be four hours a day, or then you could build up to a full day. That will just give you some time to yourself that you will not have had from the point that baby was born, and it's something that you will probably find is very needed. I started working part-time using my kit days, my keeping in touch days, while I was on maternity leave when Oren was four months old. And the first day it felt really weird and I really missed him. But now that he's older, I really value having these days where I get to do some work, but also I get a bit of time to myself too. And I actually find that I'm a better parent for it because I'm able to kind of reset myself and do a few things that I want to do. Maybe give the house a really good clean if it's something that's annoying me, or if I've been wanting to binge watch a series, I might sit down and do that. So just having time to yourself is really valuable and it's something that is going to improve your parent parenting experience and probably your parenting in general itself because a well-rested parent that's got their needs supported is better able to offer that to their children too. But obviously there is the financial implication of paying for a childminder or a babysitter. So looking into how much that's gonna cost you on average and whether that's something you can budget for is something that's gonna be really important to look at before doing this. It might also mean that you're not able to take as much maternity leave as you'd like because although in the UK it is paid, it is paid at a reduced rate. Although I will get onto childcare a little bit later, I just wanted to say that is something else to think about. The other part of building your village is building your network of 
other mums and particularly other solo mums. This is the one thing I am so pleased I did and it's been so invaluable to me in terms of moral support and also having people to hang out with and people to meet up for coffees etc. Having a network is just invaluable for sharing your experiences etc and feeling like you have solidarity with some other people. So definitely if you're thinking about doing this and if you do go down the route of getting pregnant try and reach out and find other solo mums, join groups on Facebook, join WhatsApp groups, whatever you can to get to know people because it really does make a difference if you have a physical support network of people who get it. Even if they are not offering physical childcare for you, just having someone who you can message and be like, do you want to meet up for coffee today? I'm losing the plot. Who will be like, yes, and you go and meet them. That can be amazing and so validating when you're going through a tough time. So building your village, probably the most important thing that you will need to do as a solo parent. So something you definitely need to take very seriously and think about how you're going to make it work. The next thing that's important to think about is housing. Now again, this is kind of linked to building your village and also the financial and childcare side of it. But housing is another really important thing to think about because for most people, it's one of the most expensive parts of their outgoings. When it comes to thinking about housing, there are a few things you want to consider. The first one is where you actually live. Do you live near to any potential support networks? Like I was saying before when it came to building your village, if let's say for example you had parents who you know would be really supportive and who you could really benefit from the support from, but they live like two hours away from where you live, considering whether or not you'd actually be able to move closer to them, uh, if that works with your job, would you be able to get a job in that local area or are you able to, if you are somebody for example who has moved to a big city to work, could you potentially work part-time in the office, could you hybrid work part-time in the office and part-time from home, would you be able to make that commute work, that is something that's going to be really important to think about because wherever possible you want to live close to your support networks. So I live around 10 minutes away from my parents and it has been invaluable to me and in fact at the point where I made the decision that I wanted to become a solo parent I actually had my flat on the market and was looking to move a bit further out to get somewhere a bit bigger but I decided when I made the decision I wanted to become a solo mum that actually it would be better better off for me to stay put where I was because being closer to my parents even though I'd be in a bit of a smaller property would be more useful to me than moving further away and having a bigger property but less support network around and I am so pleased I made that decision because I was absolutely right being close to my support networks was definitely more useful than having the bigger space and of course finances is going to play a role in this too because housing is very expensive at the moment so you might be in a position where let's say for example you live in a city and your parents live further out and actually moving further out you could afford to get some more space on the amount that you're paying for rent or mortgage at the moment but actually getting your costs down is going to be really helpful to you and having a baby again I'll talk about this more in finances they're all linked together so you might find that moving further out actually would allow you to get somewhere bigger for the same amount that you currently pay but it might be more useful to you to actually consider sizing down a bit and reducing your rent or your mortgage payments so that you have less of expenditure each month. That's going to really help you during your mat leave in particular and also in the early years when you have childcare costs to consider. And also hopefully you're going to be near a support network too, so it's kind of like a double bonus. When it comes to having children, babies in particular really don't need that much space. You can have a baby in a one bedroom flat and you'll be fine. You don't need as much space as like the internet might make you think. It's really only as they get bigger that you need to start thinking about having more room but in the early days when you're trying to save money for maternity leave etc sizing down could be a really good option for you. Another thing to consider and something else I have seen other solo parents do to make this work is if you are not able to move from where you currently are but let's say you have a spare bedroom renting that out to a lodger or putting it on Airbnb as another way to get some extra income in can be another really great way to support you on this journey. And the other thing I have seen some solo mums do is move back in with their parents. Again, you've got to be in a situation where you have parents that are supportive and where this could actually be feasible for you. But I have seen it done where people have moved back in and if they've owned a property, that they were living in before, they've rented that out to cover the mortgage or you know get some extra income, or if they were renting, they've just you know left that property and moved back in, and that's obviously drastically reduced their housing costs too. So there are a lot of things that you can consider, and there are more options than you might think out there to make this work, but housing is definitely something you need to think about when it comes to a journey to solo parenthood. The next thing to think about when considering becoming a solo parent is finances. Unless you are somebody with an insanely well-paid job and like the well into the six figures, 
Uh, reality is that becoming a solo parent is going to impact your finances and that is something you are going to have to factor in. For the majority of people considering going down this route, your best option is to cut back your expenses as much as possible to make your living costs minimal so that any impact and hit your finances take when it comes to A, trying to get pregnant because that can be expensive to get pregnant if you're going down like the sperm donor route, but also when it comes to being on maternity leave and the cost of childcare afterwards, all those things are going to impact on your finances. So you want to make sure that your living costs are reduced as much as you physically can. Now I've already talked about housing in the last section so that we've already kind of covered. But other things for example like, do you have a gym membership that you're never using? Can you cancel it? Do you have a car that's currently on higher purchase or that you're currently paying monthly for? Can you get to a position where you can either pay that off early? I did this myself, I paid off my higher purchase a year early so that I was A, able to save some interest, but also B, reduce my monthly payments. Or if you're not able to pay off that car in a lump sum, could you potentially downsize and downgrade your car a bit so that you are able to pay it with a lump sum of money that you get from whatever you've been paying off? Or can you reduce that monthly amount to a smaller car? Whatever it is, get your expenses down. Really going through your finances with a fine tooth comb and working out what things are essential that you have to pay for, like your housing, your food bills, your utility bills, all that stuff, and what extras you're paying for and what you could and couldn't cut back to. Working out what the minimum you need to survive on is probably one of the most important things when it comes to assessing your finances for solo parenthood. The other thing that is useful to look into is if you are an employee, looking at whether your workplace offers enhanced maternity pay. The standard maternity pay, if you are on statutory maternity pay, or also if you are entitled to maternity allowance if you're self-employed, you can look into the details online about that if you think you might qualify for that, is around £670 a month which realistically does not cover all the bills. So if you have a workplace that offers enhanced maternity pay, that is going to make your maternity leave a bit easier to manage. But if you don't have enhanced maternity pay, you're going to need to consider how much you might need to put aside into savings so that you can draw that out each month to top up your maternity pay. It is also worth looking into whether your workplace requires you to have worked there for a certain period of time before being entitled to enhanced maternity pay, and also if you need to work for a certain amount of time afterwards too in order to retain that money because some places will make you pay it back if you don't go back to work so if you are thinking about staying with where you currently are but then not returning to work or going to look to work somewhere else do make sure to check that first truthfully there are a lot of things to consider when it comes to the finances of being a solo parent and I will do a video specifically on that but I wanted to cover a few things in here just to give you a heads up looking at finances and how you think you might make that work is a very important step I probably should have mentioned earlier on in the video but this video is heavily based on the UK system and in other parts of the world it is going to be very different and childcare is a prime example of that. There are many places in Europe where childcare is much more heavily subsidised than it is in the UK and in the US I think it's not very subsidised at all so your costs might be more similar to here but bearing in mind the cost of childcare for where you live is something really important to factor in. If you do happen to be in the UK then childcare costs are very expensive. There is a new system currently being introduced in September this year where they're bringing in 15 free hours a week of childcare or 15 funded hours I should say of childcare for all children nine months up for parents that are in work and from September next year it will go up to 30 hours a week however bear in mind it's not actually 15 hours and 30 hours because it's based off of term time only so the 30 hours for example when you actually break that down across a proper year it works at about 22 hours a week which should still be helpful but just bear in mind it is not 33 hours when you're factoring that in the other thing to consider is how the government funds this depends on how many nurseries and childminders and childcare providers actually take this up. A lot of nurseries are really struggling and shutting down at the moment because of the costs of running nurseries and the cost of paying for staff and the cost of retain, even being able to retain staff etc. So it's not a given that this is something you're going to be able to access is what I'm saying. Hopefully they are going to do a better job at introducing this one but it's not something we should rely on. But childcare costs can be extortionate particularly in the first couple of years so it is something you definitely need to look into factoring in when you're looking at how you might make solo parenthood work. Something that a lot of people decide to do is to go and work part-time because they work out that actually better off doing that than paying for the extra couple of days of childcare and as long as you earn under 100,000 you are entitled to 20% of your childcare being refunded by the government however that is capped at £500 per quarter and for most people £500 per quarter is way less than 20% of their childcare bills so bear in mind that it probably won't cover the full 20% of your childcare bills the way that it works with the tax free childcare system in the UK is they basically pay the 20% the first month and the second month but if you're already at the £500 threshold they won't pay anything the third month so you'll have to pay the full childcare 
childcare bill then, so do bear that in mind. And childcare itself is quite confusing as well. There are various different options. You can go for a nursery, you can go for a childminder, you can go for a nanny, but then you won't be entitled to the hours. And so there's different ways to make it work and different things you can be entitled to, but you do need to have a look at what you think might work for you. Also, if you do shift work, will you be able to make that work with childcare? Because most people I know who do shift work have to rely on a family member to do it because the nurseries are only open like 7.30 till um, 6 o'clock in the evening or 6.30 in the evening. And if you're working an overnight shift, who's going to have your child? So factoring in things like that is something that's really important to think about. And also bear in mind that childcare isn't something that just ends once they turn three or four in this country when they're entitled to like 33 hours at funded hours a week. Um, or even when they go to school, because if you work for longer than the school hours, you're going to need wraparound care as well. So you're going to have to pay for that and work out how that's going to work too. So it's quite a complicated thing and it's something you do need to look into. And I definitely would not go into this blind. I looked into it and decided what would work best for me with Orin and like factors in the finances of that and everything. But it is quite a challenge to work it out. So it's something that I would say is definitely... It's definitely worth sitting down and looking through all your options and assessing what you think is going to work best for you and whether or not it's going to be feasible. And also, to a certain extent, you do kind of just make it work when you're here, when you have a child and they're here. But it's best to be prepared. So those are my top four things that I think are the most important to think about when you are considering becoming a solo parent. I have had no regrets so far myself in becoming a solo parent, but that journey has been made so much easier by the fact that I did a lot of this prep work before having my son and putting myself in the best place possible to make this work. It has required some sacrifices on some fronts, but it's been worth it to me. And so it's all about working out whether it's going to be workable for you and also worth it too, because you obviously don't want to go into something like this and then regret that decision. It doesn't happen very often, but you don't want to be in that boat. But I do really hope this video was helpful to any of you out there who are currently considering this journey. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe subscribing too. And let me know if there are any other aspects of selling motherhood you want me to talk about in the comments below. Thank you as always to my Precious Star Vlog Superstar members who just offer me that little bit of extra support each month. If you want to consider joining, click the join box down below and take a look at some of the extra benefits you get, including getting access to these videos early. Thank you so much everyone, do please subscribe and I will see you next week. Bye everyone, have a great day.